Physics World. Hello and welcome to the Physics World Stories podcast. I'm Andrew Glester, and in this episode, we're going to be exploring the latest in research into lithium ion batteries as they could play a pivotal role in our carbon neutral future. Later in the podcast, we'll hear from Cornish Lithium, a company looking into the mining of lithium in the southwest of the UK. But first, the Relib project, a project funded by the Faraday Institute, looks at recycling and reuse of EV lithium ion batteries. EV, or electric vehicle batteries, and the research into them are evolving at a relatively rapid rate. And a roadmap for sustainable circular economy in lithium ion and future battery technologies has been published in JFIS Energy from IOP Science. Dr. Gavin Harper, the lead researcher on that roadmap, is a research fellow at the Met for Tech UKRI Interdisciplinary Circular Economy Centre for Technology Metals at the University of Birmingham. Lithium ion batteries are starting to become ubiquitous in everyday life um, as we push towards electrification and decarbonisation. There's you know a need for a compact store where you can um, you know power electrical devices using the lightest, smallest battery that's available. And, and to that end, lithium ion batteries are the dominant technology. So we're starting to use these batteries in a whole host of applications. We're starting to manufacture them in ever greater numbers. But there's a challenge, and at some point, those batteries are going to reach the end of their lives. And at the point at which they reach the end of their lives, there's a two-sided problem. On the one side, there's a waste management challenge. We need to do something with these batteries that's sort of, you know, safe, responsible, effective and environmentally sound. But then on the other hand, there's this massive resource opportunity because, you know, companies around the world are clamouring for the key critical materials that are used to manufacture lithium-ion batteries. And we need to ensure that there's good custody of those materials and that at the end of their life, they can find their way into brand new applications. And so, you know, it's that waste management coupled with the need to conserve critical materials. And obviously there's a geopolitical dimension to all of this as well. Um, So it won't surprise you to know that lots of the core midstream processing capacity for battery materials currently is located in China. Um, They've had great foresight in developing um, battery manufacturing and materials processing and sort of seeing that the electric vehicles revolution was coming. They've captured a great deal of that market with manufacturing capability. Western automakers have been a little bit slower to catch on and I think governments as well um, haven't seen the size of the price and the potential opportunity in the way that China has done. And so countries around the world are playing catch up. They will also need to secure access to critical raw materials if they want to manufacture um, batteries indigenously. And obviously a secondary source of recycled material processing that high-grade material once it's in a country makes an awful lot of sense. When you're talking about these materials being recycled for use in other applications, does that mean as batteries, are you sort of taking car batteries and recycling them into phone batteries? There's a variety of different pathways. We want to try and keep materials in the highest value state possible. Now, it may may or may not be apparent, but when we recycle lots of materials at the moment, we downcycle them. And so, you know, we take them from a higher value um, state and we then turn them into something that's slightly inferior as a rule. If you think about newsprint and paper as a really relatable example, you know, lots of nice, you know, white and mixed papers and magazines go out, go into the process and what comes out of it, you know, a slightly muddy grey, um, you know, reasonable quality. Now, obviously, with batteries and critical materials, they're different to bulk materials. Um, and their sort of physical properties of those materials are as a result of the amount of energy um, that has been invested into refining them into a very, very high quality state. And so it's our aim to keep these materials in as high a value state as possible. But I like to think of it as a bit like a game of snakes and ladders. 
So if you start in the bottom with your raw materials, every shake of the dice is a materials processing step that improves the physical properties of those materials until you get to the top right hand side of the board and that's your finished battery. Now recycling processes, they're a little bit like the snakes that go down the board. And a process like pyrometallurgy will take that battery in a high value state at the top of the board and you'll slide all the way down almost to the bottom of the board. And then hydrometallurgy, another technology um, that is quite common in industry, that takes you a little way down the board, not quite as far, um, but it still takes you back to a much earlier stage. What we want to try and do, if possible, is to direct recycle batteries where we keep the materials in a really high value state. We don't come very far down the board. We don't have to do too much work to then turn those materials into other batteries. Um, obviously, lithium-ion battery chemistries are used in a wide range of different applications, and the same chemistry may be used in a, a mobile phone as an electric car. Um, it's not generally too much of a challenge to extract some value out of batteries that are high cobalt and nickel content. So, you know, mobile phone batteries especially, really high value, um, lots of critical materials in them. What's more challenging is some of the other battery types that are less reliant on critical materials. So there's a type of battery called LFP, lithium iron phosphate. It's used in some cheaper electric vehicles. It's also potentially used in stationary energy storage. Um, people jokingly refer to them as rust and fertilizer batteries, lithium, iron, phosphate. There's not a lot of value in the raw materials there. But there's a lot of value in the way that those materials are put together. And so if you want to reduce those materials just down to um, you know, their constituent parts, you lose the intrinsic value that comes from keeping that material together. And so some people are saying, well, what do we do with LFP batteries? Because you know, there's not a lot of value there to recover. Do we want to put a lot of effort into recycling them or... Do we want to maybe downcycle them into, uh, say, you know, agricultural chemicals, for example, because of the phosphate there? When you say a cheaper electric car, what, which ones are you talking about? Obviously, there aren't a great deal of electric cars that are especially cheap yeah. at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> if you think about the old, uh, I don't know if you remember the G Wiz yes. that uh, lots of people had on the uh, on, on the road as a way of getting around the congestion charge and uh, famously Top Gear blew quite a few of those up, I think, uh, you know, crash tested them or whatever. You know, the older generation of electric vehicles were based on lead acid batteries, lead, sulfuric acid, really nice, simple battery to recycle, you know, crack open the case, the lead sinks, um, you know, that's not particularly difficult. But I'm talking about modern electric vehicles, um, but the difference between, for example, um, your long range models and your standard range models. So if you buy a sort of a lower range standard, um, say Tesla Model 3, that will more than likely come with LFP batteries, which have got um, less range than the very, very high end vehicles. Mercedes EQS, which will have um, batteries with cobalt and nickel rich chemistries, because you need that chemistry to be able to achieve the range that high performance requires. Gavin is keen to point out the difference between reuse and recycling. We talk about recycling, you know, we can also call it urban mining. And when you think about, for example, all the discarded computers, they've got hard drives with magnets in, pumps motors, other electrical devices, if we can develop recycling technologies that are able to take that secondary material and turn it into um, you know, new products in a way that's cost efficient, then we should really be making use of those urban mines and materials. You may or may not know there's a thing that people call the waste management hierarchy, and it's like a sort of cascaded series of uses. So First of all, it's best if we can avoid making the waste in the first place. Let's not make waste. That's the sort of start of the hierarchy. And then the next step down on that ladder is to say, if we're going to make waste, it's better if we can find a way of reusing it before we recycle it. So, you know, if you've got, um, you know, a bag, a plastic bag, it's much better to be able to just use that again as a plastic bag 
rather than turning that plastic into another recycled plastic bag because you have to invest energy into it. Now, there's this whole school of thought around battery reuse where we could take electric vehicle batteries and reuse them. And reuse tends to apply to using them in another application. So, for example, um, we tend to say once a battery is less than 80% state of health, that's the point at which we want to retire it from its initial application. And what you've got to remember is that the degradation of batteries is non-linear. So it's not as if it will just progressively get worse. It gets to a point where it reaches what they call the knee. And once it crosses that point, degradation happens much more quickly. So the idea with reuse tends to be that you take a battery out of a a application where it's being used intensely and you put it into one where it's not going to be used quite as intensely so for example if you were using that battery as backup storage in a ups you know you charge it to and, and ups is uninterruptible power supply you charge it up to a level where um you know the battery can just sit happily at that state of charge and then it only needs to be discharged in the event of a power failure for example so it's not cycling all the time it's having a, a really easy shift and so it doesn't need to be you know a really good quality battery that is capable of doing lots of cycles we're also seeing this whole informal reuse market where you know people are selling old batteries crash damaged batteries whatever on um, you know marketplaces like eBay, um, and then there are a whole legion of people who have got old classic cars where the body of the car is nice, but the engine maybe was a dud, and it makes more sense for them rather than trying to source scarce engine parts or you know components that no longer exist to say you know what this car only gets used at weekends. I can buy um, some older electric vehicle batteries. They might not be, you know, the best. They might not be suitable for long miles, but all you want them for is going around the block or, you know, going to the shops or whatever. Um, and so they're repurposing those and reusing those in older heritage vehicles. Now, th there's a whole bunch of longer conversations that we could have around potential safety concerns and some of the implications of that. Um, you know, I'm not necessarily saying that, I'm wholly on board with that as a good idea, um, but it's something that's happening out there. And it's, you know, so reuse is, has, has got a lot of potential as well as recycling. I've got an electric car parked on the drive there. I've got a battery for my house here. The electric car's, what, 40 something kilowatt battery. The house is a nine point something kilowatt battery. So if, if that car sort of went to 80% of that, that's a, an awful lot of storage that I could be putting into my house, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. And I think the other thing is to thinking about into the future, um, you know, it's not necessarily a nil sum game that you've got to take that battery out of the car to use that as backup power for your house. So if you look at, um, I think Hyundai is one of the manufacturers that's been um, really quick off the blocks with this. There's this concept of vehicle to grid, you know, where your vehicle can potentially be used as storage. And I think, that actually makes a great deal of sense. If we look at how battery technology has innovated in the past few years, we're seeing batteries last much longer than people anticipated. Um, this is a challenge for recyclers because they're taking a lot longer to come back to the end of life and reach recycling um, as people anticipated. Um, and so people's predictions on when those batteries will need recycling are by and large quite a bit out. Um, but if you've got vehicle to grid technology on the vehicle, you can trade energy between, you know, the house and the vehicle. Um, some companies are starting to offer smart tariffs where if you use energy at different times, um, you know, you get preferential rates. And you could imagine a future whereby, you know, as we start to decarbonize, as we need people to be more flexible in their use of electricity, um, and as there is less you know, thermal power plant providing spinning reserve on the grid. Um, we could actually have a legion of electric vehicles with a degree of flexibility as to when they're charging and being charged and able to supply power back to the grid, trading energy with the grid. And why I think this makes lots of sense is, um, first of all, the battery is contained within the application that it was originally 
engineered to be within. So, you know, if a battery's within a vehicle, there are no safety concerns about it being, you know, sort of uh, MacGyvered into a new configuration. You know, it's been done professionally. Um, it's where it should be. The second thing is, is that because batteries are lasting so long, if you look around scrapyards at the moment, you will see many cars with perfectly good engines because engines last longer than vehicles as a rule. It's rare that people scrap a car because the engine has blown up. You know, more often than not, it's because it's been involved in a prang or because it's failed its MOT on rust or, you know, something's wrong with it where the cost of repair exceeds the value of the vehicle. Obviously, there are classic vehicles. There are things that are really aesthetically nice that people prize and will maintain and hold on for for a long time. But in terms of run of the mill vehicles, you know, people get to a point where they think, ah, oh, you know, the, the novelty of this car has worn off. It may still be barely functional. And so, when you talk about battery life improving, you know, there are people that are now talking about this concept of million mile batteries. Well, how many million mile cars do you see out there other than the odd taxi, you know? And so if we've got batteries that are able to perform with that level of repeatability, um, then why wouldn't you use that asset on your driveway to generate you money um, by being able to buy and trade power with the grid? And, and, you know, it's a different scenario with very long life batteries compared to one where we might have thought some time ago when batteries were more of an unknown oh, why would you want to degrade your very expensive battery to, you know, earn a few pence here and there selling with the grid? But, I mean, as we've seen with the energy industry, price gouging consumers um, recently, you know, energy costs are bigger than uh, anyone anticipated in a long time and every little helps. Just a quick aside here, because I know some of you who are listening may be interested in the practicalities of batteries within the home as it stands at the moment. And as I mentioned to Gavin, I do have an electric car and have a battery in my house. I've got solar panels on the roof. And the idea behind it is, of course, it's good for the planet. That's the main motivating factor for me doing it. But it's also with the price of energy and the cost of living as it is at the moment, putting that initial outlay out there to buy the batteries, put the solar panels on the roof and have an electric car means that I'm not paying petrol prices, I'm paying very little for the fuel, the electricity that goes into my car. I have a flexible tariff where the electricity is cheaper overnight. Clearly I'm getting solar energy during the day, so if I've used up all the solar energy and I need to charge the car overnight, it'll cost me about £4 to fill up the car with electricity. That gives me about somewhere between 120 and 150 miles. If I'm charging up with solar energy, of course, it's free. If you imagine how much money you're spending on petrol yourself, perhaps you might see the attraction of a system like this. But this podcast isn't really for consumer advice, and I wanted to talk to Gavin about those geopolitical arguments that he'd referred to. To some extent, it doesn't matter where things are produced. You know, you can take a view that... um, you know, free markets deliver the best solution and let's just buy things from the place that gives us the cheapest labour and the cheapest product. That's that's one way that people see the world. Another way to see the world is to say, actually, the car industry is something that's really important. It provides jobs, it provides livelihoods, it provides honest wages, it supports families. Um, You know, hundreds of thousands of people in the UK work in car factories and supply chains. And so it's really important to preserve some of that domestic industry in the UK. And at the moment, we have an industry where we have absolutely phenomenal expertise in the UK around internal combustion engines um, and lots of plants that are capable of producing internal combustion engines and lots of expertise and skills and a whole range of suppliers. But actually, that's pretty useless in the next few years because, um, you know, demand for those engines is going to die back um, as you know there's a push to reduce our use of fossil fuels and so if we want to have vehicles made in the UK 
it's important that we have the solutions in the UK um, to be able to develop those and produce those indigenously. And the countries that are able to secure the manufacturing capability for batteries and for motors are going to become the focal points for where vehicles are made in the future because that gives you your competitive advantage. You know, why would you want to make a car somewhere where you didn't have ready access to the batteries and the motors when they're, you know, the enormous part of um, adding value to the vehicle? You know, there was a time, if you go back to the sort of earlier days of the British motor industry, where we did alliances with other countries that didn't have the capability to manufacture their own cars. And Britain would sell, you know, what they called CKD, completely knocked down kits, where it would be a car in a box and it would be shipped out to some far flung country. And someone with a bag of spanners would then put the car together out of the bits of the kit, Meccano style. Um, you know, is that what we want for the UK going forwards? You know, we used to have so much sovereign capability and, you know, we really want to try and look at the potential for retaining those good jobs in the UK by ensuring that we've got the battery and motor manufacturing capacity and also the critical materials that are going to supply those supply chains. I'm picking up from this that that's not kind of what's happening we're not moving towards that politically in the country at the moment well i think you know there's been a lot of rhetoric there's been a lot of hot air um there's been a lot of press releases um you know there's there's other people that have observed the battery industry and have looked at initiatives around the world and you know what matters at the end of the day is bricks foundations you know actual things being built not just nice visions and architects renderings and i think the challenge is that in the uk there's been an awful lot of enthusiasm we've got phenomenal research and innovation capability in the uk you know it's the old story that the uk has got real leadership around science but we're just really rubbish at translating that into actual physical product And I think, you know, for all of the um, excitement and, um, you know, press releases about government support, what we haven't managed to do in the UK is really establish that battery manufacturing capacity at scale. And if we look at Europe and if we look at America, um, they realise the urgency with which they need to play catch up. And so the um, you know resources that are being diverted into um, trying to establish those industries from the ground up are sort of commensurate with the scale of the challenge. And I think although there's been some support in the UK, um, it doesn't meet toe-to-toe with either the scale of the challenge or the scale of investment that other competing nations are putting into this. And of course, you know, there's a whole range of other geopolitical factors in terms of where the country's at at the moment with Brexit, um, you know, which make the UK a more challenging place to consider investing. Can we in the UK be mining these materials or do we have to go elsewhere to, to get the materials in the first place? So I think, you know, it depends on the material that you're talking about. Um, certainly in far as far as lithium, there's been a flurry of excitement around Cornwall. Um, there's a number of firms there that are looking at using innovative technologies to extract lithium um, from deposits there. I think... My understanding is that those technologies will produce lithium that's a little bit more expensive than it can be produced around the world. So that works in a market where lithium price is high because of demand. And I think, you know, potentially we're in a scenario where the lithium price will be high because there's phenomenal demand for lithium ion batteries um, and people can only develop mines and capacity at a certain rate. Now, in terms of other materials, nickel, um, you know, it's spread a little bit more around the world. There's more diversity of sources. Um, Type 1 nickel 
is the thing that we're really interested in. Um, so that's high quality nickel um, that can be used for battery cathodes. Other lower quality type 2 nickel is more appropriate for sort of use in metallurgy and alloys, um, not really suited to being at battery grade. Um, cobalt is the one that's really problematic. So the majority of the world's cobalt comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, it's a country that has lots of challenges. Um, there is concern around artisanal small scale mining, um, you know, children in the supply chain and in informal mining. Um, there's also the fact that sort of China has really um, secured a great monopoly on cobalt processing around the world. So most of the world's cobalt comes out of the DRC, flows into China, where China then, you know, add the value and then it flows out. So that's in terms of battery materials. And, and there's not really um, a great opportunity to diversify the production of battery materials in the UK. British Geological Survey have recently done a report of UK um, natural resources. But then again, you know, there are challenges with mining and extractive industries. Um, you know, do people necessarily want that on their doorstep? And, and there's a whole debate around, you know, all the challenges that you'd have to do around mine development. One company hoping to take advantage of the geological treasures hiding in the ground in the UK is Cornish Lithium. Ali Salisbury is a project geologist for Cornish Lithium. I run a lot of our drilling programs and sampling campaigns to actually abstract the geothermal water from our boreholes. And I'm involved in the exploration process to find where we want to drill for research boreholes and exploration boreholes to get this geothermal water out of the out of the ground. Cornwall has a quite a unique geological setting in the overall UK setting really. It's underlain by this huge granite batholith that spans all the way from the Isles of Scilly in the west to the west of Devon on the Dartmoor granite. And the granite Pluton has essentially made it quite a special place because it brought with it as it was exhumed lots of mineralizing fluids. And this caused lots of the tin and copper mineralization that's been historically mined in Cornwall. But as well as the granite Pluton itself, Cornwall's been historically fractured throughout the 300 million years since the granite was exhumed. And this has allowed for water to ingress into these fractures through seawater, meteoric water. And over that time period, it's leached bits of lithium out of this mineral called uh, mica that you find in granites across the globe, but the mica in Cornwall is particularly enriched in lithium. And it's leached into these geothermal waters, which we are intercepting at depth and pumping to the surface to extract the lithium from. How easy is it to get the lithium from those waters and what kind of quantities are we talking about? It's quite a new industry, really, this lithium extraction technology. It wasn't really known about six, seven, eight years ago so there are lots of companies looking at trying to get the or the best ways to get the lithium out of the out of the water and what we're doing is we're trialing lots of different technologies on the particular chemistries that we have or that we see in in the water that we're abstracting and it's a combination of either um, membrane filtration so what you might see in a Brita filter for example but on a bit of a more complicated larger scale or adsorption or absorption techniques. So specially manufactured media that attracts the lithium ions that are free in the water and it sticks to these, this media and then we wash it off and we're left with a lithium chloride concentrate, which we can then process to a lithium grade battery material. Do you have any concept of you know how much there is there? How long could this be a process of for how many batteries is it going to make? Yeah, no, yeah. Um, it's, it's, to be honest, it's a bit of a work in progress at the moment, but we are aiming to have up to 20 or 25 boreholes across the county that we can abstract this water from. And we're expecting to be able to get between 500 and 1,000 tonnes of um, lithium carbonate equivalents, or LCE, per year out of these boreholes. And that equates to um, if you have about 200 kilograms of lithium in a car battery, it's, um, I don't know, you can do the maths. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
but it's, 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 a, it's a reasonable amount. And I should say we also have a um, hard rock project running in parallel that we've just released our scoping study for uh, at the end of last year. And that's essentially repurposing an old China clay pit that will that will be mining the lithium from the granite itself because that region in Cornwall around St. Austell is particularly enriched in lithium. And we're expecting to be able to produce between eight and 10,000 tons of LCE per year from that side of things. And I think somebody did the maths for that. And it's that, that equates to about 40,000 car batteries okay. per year. Wow. Okay. That's, that's quite a lot, isn't it? What I would say is that our listeners are very interested in physics. So quite a lot of them will be doing the maths themselves. As we've that's early. <laughs> <laughs> for how long? Would you be able to extract that lithium per year? We've done extended pump tests on some of our wells, but we're in the process of upscaling that test work to exactly understand the sort of resource that we're looking at. But we're expecting them to have quite a long life cycle. So it's a very difficult question to answer, and it's it's something that we're working on at the moment, to be honest. When are your explorations and your testings going to be giving us the answers that we need in terms of quantity and longevity. We're currently constructing a demonstration plant over in our hard rock um, facility, and that's coming online within the next year. And then we're hoping to get into commercial production for that by 2026. And we believe that we'll have our first commercial geothermal waters borehole up and running by 2028 so it's on those sort of time scales when we'll be able to start answering those those questions we've only been around since 2016 the first te- first technical team or first members of the technical team were hired in 2018 and since then we've been working very hard to answer those exact questions as gavin mentioned earlier in the podcast question marks arise whenever mining happens particularly if it's in your own local area if you don't know cornwall it is a particularly beautiful part of the world. Having a mining company there must surely raise some questions along these lines. Here's Ali Salisbury again. Well, I think there are lots of misconceptions surrounding exactly why people want to go into mining and want to go into geology or want to go into exploration. For myself, I couldn't see myself working for an oil and gas company, for example, or a company that was a, a mineral exploration company that was looking for gold or or some sort of material that wasn't going to be useful for the green revolution that we're seeing. It's just close to my heart, really. I became a geologist because I liked science and I liked the environment and I like nature. It, it all makes sense to me, really. Um, what I can say is that we are trying to do the most responsible thing we can. We see where lithium's mined across the rest of the planet. It's, it's not always done in the best way we believe and we're trying to go above those um above what's being done elsewhere so in terms of our lithium and geothermal waters projects we are using this technology called direct lithium extraction that is a completely contained process and we don't require lots of water we don't require lots of um open space to, like they do in south america where they're flooding huge lagoons to evaporate the water off to concentrate their lithium up where we're using um, the other suite of technologies to actually extract the lithium straight out of the water without those without those requirements and for our and and the, the footprint on the ground itself is going to be pretty small we're envisaging it's going to be the size of a small supermarket or you know what do you call them a uh, small little like tesco metro type thing on the surface of the ground which we can then cover with a with a barn looking structure and we can have all of the equipment contained within there over a small diameter borehole and then on our hard rock side of things we are um actually repurposing an old china clay pit so it's infrastructure that's already on the ground and it's uh sort of a a mine site a quarry that we can actually reutilize um, and reuse for the purposes of mining lithium out of the ground. And in terms of energy consumption um, for processing the lithium out of out of the ore that we find there, we're using a, a process called the Lepidico process, which doesn't require huge roasting temperatures of the mineral to liberate the lithium out of it. So for example, in Australia, to liberate lithium out of spodumene, which is the ore that they find there, they need to roast it up to about 1,000 degrees Celsius 
and it's it, we don't need to go through that process at all we actually we use an acid leaching process completely contained within um, a self-sustaining system as well so we don't have any leachate leaking out or any environmental ramifications in that sense of things if you have this lithium are there electric vehicle battery manufacturers knocking at your door waiting for it to come along so currently in the uk there's not really a battery manufacturing um supply chain we have electric vehicle manufacturers but they just build they put the components together that they receive from elsewhere but we're definitely hoping that that there will be a battery factory up and running by the time that we're at commercial production that we can sell our product to um in terms of who that might be i'm just a lowly geologist and it's for <laughs> it's for other people to answer those questions but from what from what i've heard there there has been there have been discussions and there has been interest clearly if a key aspect of using batteries is for environmental reasons then sourcing them locally is of particular interest and i'm sure geologists all over the world are working in a similar way looking for lithium and other crucial battery components in the ground beneath your feet, wherever you are. If you're an electric vehicle owner, or perhaps you've considered being one, you've probably had the question posed to yourself, or even asked yourself the question, is it really more environmentally friendly to have an electric vehicle than a petrol one? Here's Gavin Harper again. So, I think there's an awful lot of media hyperbole, and and it's just such a shame the environment in which we live in people are bombarded with information and not all of it is obviously factual or correct you know to really make a sober analysis of the merits of different products against each other we need to do a life cycle assessment now um, if you look at the life cycle of an electric vehicle versus a conventional vehicle um, there are more impacts in manufacturing an electric vehicle so we need to put more energy, more material, because they're a little bit more complicated to make in the first place. And I think the impact at end of life as well is a little bit greater. Um, but there's a bit more involved in recycling an electric vehicle compared to a conventional vehicle. But what that neglects, focusing on those two ends of the vehicle life, is that actually by far the bulk of the vehicle impact occurs in the use phase you know when that vehicle is being driven out and about and so by comparison um, the impacts at the beginning and end of life are relatively negligible Um, but you think about the massive carbon emissions that come from driving vehicles hundreds of thousands of miles and you know that's been modeled and even in scenarios where your electricity comes from a relatively high carbon source um, because of the intrinsic efficiency of electric power trains and also the fact that you know it's more efficient to generate energy in a centralized thermal power station you know than in lots of little motors in individuals cars um, and it's also it's you know potentially easy to control the emissions as well when you do it on scale so you know the impacts of electric vehicles in a whole range of scenarios is lower Um, than conventional vehicles does that mean that there's not room for doing things better no but i think there's lots of scope there's lots of room certainly the more that i've looked into critical materials and vehicles the more it's made me you know a little bit of uh, healthy cynicism about some things but i think these are all you know exciting challenges to work on and uh, you know we need to strive for better thank you very much to gavin and ali for talking to me we'll post links to their work including that roadmap to this lithium-ion battery future and the article associated with this episode of the podcast on physicsworld.com. Don't forget you can find another podcast from Physics World called Physics World Weekly. But the Physics World Stories podcast will be back very soon when we'll be looking at the growing impact of the Jocelyn Bell Burnell Graduate Scholarship Fund. And thank you very much for listening. Physics World.